The Mohawk Trail. This is a road in Massachusetts which follows Route 2 from the town of Greenfield to North Adams. North Adams is known for its hairpin turn on Route 2, which is a beloved scenic destination and drive-by that offers beautiful panoramic views that span over 63 miles. This trail is known both locally and nationally for the great views that drivers encounter. Along this route from Greenfield to North Adams lies a small town called Florida. And it's not that Florida that you're thinking about, it's a small town located in Berkshire County, Massachusetts. It is part of the Pittsfield, Massachusetts metropolitan area. It is also home to the east portal of the Husick Tunnel, as well as Whitcomb Summit, which is the highest point of the Mohawk Trail. Hey listeners, and welcome back to another episode of Dark Crossroads. I am so excited to cover today's case because we are going to be spreading light on a case that has been cold for over 40 years. Yeah, you heard me, 40 years. With some updated information added to this case, I was very much looking forward to helping spread some light on it. And with that said, let's get started. Lynn Burdick's family instantly knew that something was wrong when their daughter did not come home on April 17, 1982. Lynn had turned 18 just a few months earlier and was described as being studious, well-behaved, shy, quiet, and very much of a homebody who was not the type to run off, especially with all the responsibilities that she had at home. While some may have found her life in the Berkshires to be boring, Lynn seemed to be happy and certainly never complained. Her friends said that she was funny and a joy to be around. She didn't smoke, drink, or do drugs. Lynn was a senior at McCann Vocational Technical High School in 1982. She planned to stay at home after graduation and help take care of her chronically ill mother and save up money to eventually, hopefully, la 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 la, go to college. She was also trying to save money to get a prom dress. Um, Although the high school senior was very shy around boys and did not expect to have a date, she did still want to go to prom. Go you, you're awesome. She didn't have a driver's license or a car, and she wasn't dating anyone at the time of her disappearance. Lynn lived in a small, unpainted clapboard house, which was somewhat crowded. She lived with her mother, father, aunt, uncle, and two cousins. Yep, you heard me. The whole shebang. Lynn had her own small bedroom located in the attic of the home, which was always kept tidy and contained many of her childhood toys. Lynn was the youngest of four siblings, what? Dang. And did not mind carrying her weight on her family's 25-acre property in Florida, Massachusetts. The family grew their own produce and tended to various cows, chickens, and pigs. All of this was a lot of work, but Lynn loved spending time with her family and the animals. Lynn excelled at school and was expected to graduate with high honors before her disappearance. When she wasn't studying, Lynn was earning extra money babysitting kids around the neighborhood, including her nieces and nephews, of course. She also helped her mother, who was sick with emphysema, and volunteered at the local church and various charity events from muscular dystrophy and cerebral palsy. She also worked part-time at her cousin Gary's store as a clerk. The store was titled the Barefoot Peddler Country Store and was located along the Mohawk Trail in the foothills of the Green Mountain Range. Due to its isolated location, crime, of course, was rare and abductions were very rare. It wasn't the sort of place that people would randomly drive through. 
leading police to speculate that the abductor was fi- was familiar with the area, which makes sense. I mean, they knew the area. They knew people weren't from there that often, or they knew it was a quiet little town. The store was located on the corner of Route 2 and Central Shaft Road in the tiny town, home to approximately 700 people and just a few hundred yards from her family's home, according to the Doe Network. How convenient. Just walk to work. She had been working at the store for three years, and it is at this store that she was last seen on April 17th. Lynn's day started with shopping with her mother, and most of her afternoon was spent at a family gathering at a local bar. Later, Lynn's brother Brian dropped her off at the Barefoot Peddler, because again, she did not have a car or a driver's license. While Lynn was old enough to work alone and the area was considered safe, normally her friend Teresa or one of the shop owners, which were her cousins, would keep Lynn company. But Teresa was busy that night and her cousin Gary and his wife Sue also stayed home that night to tend to their sick son. Lynn's sister Faye told Dateline that this meant it was Lynn's first shift by herself, working the later hours and closing the store down. By all accounts, Lynn's shift was going very well when Sue, her cousin, called the store around 8 p.m. to check on Lynn. She was scheduled to close the store in an hour. Lynn stated that it was very slow with just a few customers coming in and out, guessing it was most likely due to the rainy weather outside. During this conversation, though, around 8.10 p.m., Sue was able to hear the sound of a bell, indicating the store's front door had just been opened. Can't talk, said Lynn. I got a customer. Lynn promised to call Sue back when she was done and was starting to close the store. She has not been heard from since. Lynn's mother tried to call the store around 8.30 p.m., but got no answer. But she was also unconcerned at this time and assumed her daughter was just serving a customer. About 10 minutes later, another customer and also friend of the family entered the store at approximately 8.40 p.m. and noticed that it was abandoned and the door was open. He obviously found this strange because he knew that Lynn worked at the store and knew the days that she worked and expected to see her when he walked in. He ends up calling Lynn's parents to tell them the store was unattended and Lynn was nowhere in sight. Her family immediately contacts the police. Investigators arrived at the Barefoot Peddler and found no sign of a struggle. They found Lynn's open book on the counter beside a half-empty soda, which seemed to be completely undisturbed. Lynn, along with her school jacket and purse, were missing. Approximately $187 had been taken from the store's register, but additional cash was still available underneath the counter, which Lynn would have been aware of, but the intruder most likely would not have known of its placement. Working with a small amount of physical evidence and no witnesses, the authorities concluded that she was most likely abducted. Nothing suggested otherwise. The police thought at first that she might have run away, but that was soon changed after they discovered that there was more cash left untouched under the counter. Detectives were confident that Lynn was not the kind of teenager who would steal money from her cousin's store and take off for unknown reasons. They were convinced that she had been abducted during a robbery, and they estimated that the crime had taken place shortly after she had gotten off the phone with her cousin and before her mother reported calling her at 8.30. Detectives believed that Lynn had already been abducted when her mother tried to contact her. Over the next 10 days, hundreds of people, police and firefighters took part in the search for Lynn, scouring the mountainous terrain for any clues as to what might have happened to her. The terrain was rough and included steep ravines, creeks, heavily wooded areas, and also rain and snow had combined together to cover the area in a layer of mud and frozen slush. There were numerous decaying cabins that had long been abandoned by their owners, 
desolate dirt roads, and a few scattered campgrounds. The entire area was thoroughly searched, but nothing was found. They searched for her with volunteers, police, planes, and helicopters. Authorities scoured the Husic Tunnel that had been bored through the Husic Range of the Green Mountains. At almost five miles in length, it was considered one of the greatest engineering feats of the 19th century. It ran from the town of Florida to North Adams, Massachusetts, and searchers covered it completely. Once again, their search ended without finding anything that helped lead them to Lynn. The day after she disappeared, she had been scheduled to participate in a benefit at a local roller skating rink to raise money for people with cerebral palsy. She was a genuinely nice teenager who enjoyed helping those who were less fortunate than her. All the leads in this case have been few and far between since her disappearance in 1982. The Berkshire State Police focused on a lead in a separate incident of an unidentified male who attempted to abduct a girl from the Williams College campus 13 miles west of Florida, Massachusetts, on the same night that Lynn ended up disappearing. They believe that this incident could be involved in Lynn's disappearance. According to Lynn's Charlie Project entry, the man tried to force the intended victim into a vehicle at about 7 p.m. The woman managed to escape, but the attack took place approximately 40 minutes before Lynn was last seen. A police officer believed he spotted the alleged suspect's vehicle traveling towards Florida on Route 2 a short time after the Williams College incident. The vehicle matched the description of the vehicle driven by the suspect, but the car and driver could not be identified. The barefoot peddler was located on Route 2, placing the suspect near Lynn's location at the time. The witness in that case provided enough of a description to help authorities create a composite depicting a white male who was about 5 feet and 7 inches tall. Lynn's father, Rufus Burdick, ended up taking time off of his job as a machinist to assist in the search for his daughter. Even after the official search was called off on April 27th, he absolutely refused to stop looking for her. He was convinced that she had been abducted and was being held somewhere against her will. He wouldn't even consider the fact that she might be dead and searched tirelessly for her. Eventually, the family's precarious financial situation forced him to return back to work, but he never stopped believing that Lynn would be found alive. In 1995, Lynn's father received an anonymous letter, which was the last significant lead in the case. The letter was postmarked from Boston and from a man stating that his daughter had been abducted and murdered by a man in North Adams, Massachusetts. Authorities are familiar with the suspect stated in the letter and pleaded for the letter's author to come forward with more information and reveal what he knew to the two authorities. North Adams is near Florida and it is believed that Lynn's case could have been connected to the mentioned suspect who was interviewed extensively by police, but there is no evidence to support this theory. The writer remains unidentified and authorities do not know if the note was a hoax. Another theory that has floated around is that a supposed serial killer is responsible for her disappearance because of previous attacks on young girls around her age in the area at the time. This has not been confirmed or denied. Both of Lynn's parents have passed away since her disappearance, but all of her siblings are still alive and they still live in the Florida, Massachusetts area. Lynn's niece, Debbie Devine, who was just a toddler in 1982 and one of the children that Lynn used to babysit, has taken over the search for her older relative and vows to continue pushing for justice until her Aunt Lynn is found, no matter how long it takes. Debbie's parents, Brian and Bernadette, still live in the Blue Ranch-style home in Florida, where Lynn grew up. They were unable to keep Lynn's room the same as how she left it in 1982. But the family is eager to find her and always makes sure to leave the porch light on for her, should Lynn ever find her way home. This is the first time I have read this out loud, and that sentence just brought tears to my eyes.
the fact that they have had hope this whole time and leave that light on for her. It's amazing. Lynn's case received renewed attention in 2021 when her niece, Debbie Devine, created a fundraiser to cover billboard costs to advertise her aunt's case. According to the Berkshire Eagle, my grandmother and grandfather passed and they didn't know what happened. Somebody out there knows something. Maybe they'll decide it's time to say something. The loved ones of Lynn also created a Facebook page called Finding Lynn Burdick in hopes of getting answers. And I highly suggest that everybody go and follow this page. It has information about the case, information about her, and is also a safe place to um, offer any info or details about it to help with the family. On August 30th, officials with the Berkshire County District Attorney's Office and the Massachusetts State Police jointly released a series of age progress photos with assorted grooming alterations. Basically, they um, age progressed the original picture and they added um, a mustache, beard, different hairstyles. There's four different ones that they released. They did this with the hope that it would bring them closer to learning what happened to Lynn, who disappeared over 40 years ago. A composite sketch of the suspect was originally created in 1982 after the college student escaped her would-be abductor about 45 minutes earlier from Lynn being taken. The new forensic sketches were a collaboration with an artist from the Lincoln Police Department. Authorities claim that the suspect would now be around 70 to 80 years old and was originally described as a white man being 5'7" and also believes to have ties to the state of Vermont. District Attorney Andrea Harrington stated, I thank the witnesses and the entire Burdick family for their strength and dedication while counting to work with investigators assigned to Lynn's case. My office, the Berkshire State Police Detective Unit, and the Massachusetts State Police Unresolved Case Unit remain steadfast in following up on every lead and bringing advanced resources to unresolved homicides. Lynn's birthday was on February 4th, 1964, making her only 18 years old at the time of her disappearance on April 17th, 1982. She went missing in Florida, Massachusetts, and her case is classified as endangered missing white female. She stood at 5'4 and weighed roughly 115 pounds according to the Doe Network. She is described as a white female with brown hair and blue eyes last seen wearing her prescription glasses and a McCann Tech School class ring engraved with her name or her initials on it with a blue stone. She may have been wearing her McCann Vocational Technical High School jacket, a pair of blue jeans, and carrying her purse. Dental records and DNA samples are available, available for her and have been submitted to her case. If Lynn was alive today, she would be in her 60s. Lynn's case remains open and unsolved, but police believe that Lynn's case can be solved if the right person will finally come forward to tell detectives all that they know about the case. If you have any information on the disappearance of Lynn and Verdict or on the attempted kidnapping in Williamstown, you are encouraged to contact the Massachusetts State Police's Berkshire Barracks. Their phone number is 413 413- 499-1112, extension 306. You can also email the Massachusetts State Police Unresolved Case Unit at mspunresolved at pol.state.ma.us. If you want to hang out some more, check us out on social media, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, Pinterest, etc. You can also see the latest on the podcast at our website and the blog, and you can also enter case suggestions through the website or by emailing darkcrossroadspodcast at gmail.com. Thank you guys so much for listening. Don't forget to rate and follow us and stay tuned for more.
See you guys next time.